Hey folks, Dr. Mike here for Renaissance Periodization. And today's video is about the three pieces of gym gear that advanced bodybuilders have to have. Of course, that's a clickbait title. But three pieces of gym gear that I think have huge benefits for advanced bodybuilding. And please make all the inside gear jokes you would like in the comments. It boosts the algorithm. Here's the deal. First, what is an advanced bodybuilder? It is somebody, in my view, the best definition for this I've been able to come up with is somebody for whom the basics executed normally no longer cause reliable gains, for whom even some insight, like, oh, I have to start deloading, I have to start following program, they no longer produce reliable gains. This individual has to have training go as well as possible in order for any gains to be even highly probabilistic. Otherwise, the default is no gains at all. That's right. You have seen people training for years at your gym, putting in lots of effort and not seemingly progressing. You could technically call them advanced if they have already done a lot of the basics pretty well, and it's just the nuances they're riding on. For folks in that situation, nuances matter as far as executing your training. For example, at that point, technique has to be personalized to whatever gives you the best Stimulus to fatigue ratio, not somebody else. An intermediate can squat like most people and get decent squat results. An advanced person may have to squat very differently for their own body type or even abandon squats altogether and search out other better stimulus to fatigue ratio exercises. With nuances like that, it also makes sense that some gym gear, stuff you can buy and take with you that help you lift, may also start to make advantages at the advanced level that are mm, difficult to ignore and unwise to kind of relegate to thinking, well, you, know, you could use this stuff, but you don't have to use it. No, no, this stuff really does pay big dividends, especially for the advanced. First thing, first on that list is the VersaGrip. Now, the VersaGrip company, they have ignored all my calls and emails. I never called or emailed them, but I did talk to them once at the Arnold, and I was like, hey, like, I have a following, and I want to rep you guys. I don't need any money. Just want to be able to say that we're cool. And they're like, yeah, we don't do uh, we don't do uh, brand sponsorships for athletes. Like, okay. Uh, you guys are cool. Anyway. Oh, look, a train I have to catch. And I ran under the train and committed suicide. So that didn't go so well. But so this is not any kind of sales pitch. I make nothing off of this or anything else really here. Versa grips. Versa grips essentially are the modern version of a lifting strap, and they are categorically better in almost every way. They're all pretty close to magic. If you wrap the Versa Grip handle around something and put your hand on top of it, there's a very good chance your entire hand will fall off of the bone before that Versa Grip breaks or is let go, right? Or let's go. And because of that major advantage, Versa Grips can take back training deadlift training, any training where you have to pull with your arms, especially shoulder training. How do you do laterals with your regular grip is beyond me. If your shoulders have gotten as strong as most people's shoulders get in relation to their grip, if your back has gotten as big as strong as it usually will in relation to your grip, if your legs get as strong for stiff-legged deadlifts and dumbbell lunges, etc., as strong as the normal people's legs get when they're advanced in relation to their grip, because the grip gets stronger, but the back and the traps, and they're often, and the legs for sure, are often way stronger muscle groups. If that happens, you can no longer use many exercises without grip becoming the predominant limiting factor. When you're training your back, short of like lat prayers and a few other things, your grip may be the only thing you are training very hard after a while. If you get Versa grips, now of course you can have regular straps are fine, chalk is very good, but Versa grips show me that you are interested in the highest level of grip ability and you're just interested in completely shutting off the limiting factor. You can do machine rows and it's all just down to your back. Amazing, huge dividends. I can't recommend this product more. If you haven't gotten it and you tell me you're advanced and I see your workouts, you better have the strongest fucking grip of all time or you just haven't thought things through. Next, weightlifting belt. Any kind of belt is really good. I prefer the Pioneer brand belts because they have so much customization and they're really high quality, but 
Other belt companies are fine. Some of them very good, in fact. A weightlifting belt, or a lifting belt in general, doesn't have to be for the sport of weightlifting. A, a, a lifting belt allows you to create a high level of intra-abdominal pressure in your core and lumbar region, which allows you to transduce more of a signal to contract especially your legs during heavy leg training. And what that does is it just ekes out more ability out of your legs. Now, as a beginner, as an intermediate, that probably just doesn't matter that much. And your legs and core will be in ratio relatively strong enough to each other that you have a core realistically that can outlift your legs and that's never too weak. But your legs get stronger than your core. We know this because almost every power lifter at the high level, when it is legal to do so, will wear a lifting belt. The reason for that is pretty simple. The core tends to be a weak link. And if you make it stronger via the addition of a belt, notice you're not making the core stronger itself, you're making the whole system of core plus belt stronger. If you use a belt, you can get more out of your legs. And as a hard lifting lifter, if you're doing hack squats, if you're doing regular squats, if you're doing good mornings as a high advanced bodybuilder, you probably are interested in putting on a belt because it will just maximize what you get out of your glutes, your hamstrings, and your quads at the very least. And if you're going to do any kind of deadlifting, it also keeps your back nice and safe at heavier loads than you would normally be able to use, which is a really, really big deal. It's a big help. Is it mandatory? Of course not. But does it make the situation better where it actually makes your legs get absolutely higher raw stimulus magnitude training? Yes. Yes, it sure does. Will it make your core weaker to wear a belt? Yes. But only if you wear a belt and never increase how much weight you're lifting above what you could have done without a belt. If you can squat 225 for 10 without a belt, if you put on a belt and squat 225 for 10 and never go above the 20 or 30 extra pounds the belt can let you lift for the same reps, then yeah, sure shit. Your core will get weaker, the belt will remain, and then it'll be harder to squat 225 for 10 without the belt in a few weeks. Why the fuck would you do that? You put on the belt so you can go and get stronger in your legs, and now you can squat 240 with a belt for 10s. 225 for 10 with a belt without a belt will still feel weirder, and for a few weeks you'll be weaker just because you've learned to use the belt so well. But the underlying strength and size of the core musculature will continue to go up if you use a belt if you challenge yourself. So if you ever want to take the belt off, it'll feel weird to use it, no belt squats for a while, but then very shortly within several weeks, literally two or three, you will be as strong as you ever were without the belt. Amazing. Lastly, number three are weightlifting shoes. These are shoes for the sport of weightlifting. They have a heel and a, an easy, slow ramp that ends at about three quarters of an inch to one and a quarter inch typically at the end in the heel itself. These shoes allow for a huge amount of stability in leg training movements. They allow a ton of friction between whatever it is you're standing on and the shoe itself. And because they have that ramp situation, the actual heel lift, you get two things out of it. One is you can now go much deeper with all sorts of pressing and squatting movements and get your quads at better stimulus. And concomitantly, you don't have to lean forward as far because your ankle mobility is now higher because of that heel so you can actually take stress off of the back and put it into the quads. Amazing. And also, you have the ability now, in many more situations, with a deeper range of motion, to continue to press through your heels and your the front of your feet. And if you can press through the whole foot, you can lift more weight, activate more faster switch motor units, and get bigger and stronger. Bigger, for sure. So, weightlifting shoes not only put your quads into the best possible position to get torched, because they allow your knee to ha have more flexion with less of your uh, back inflection. So they allow you to go deeper and provide more profound forces. They essentially allow you to expose your quads by putting them kind of in a weaker position, but a more challenging position for them. But at the same time, the weightlifting shoes arm your quads with the ability to be super stable and press through the heel, which is kind of the ultimate in engineering the best possible leg training. When you put on weightlifting shoes versus not having used them, you take any hack squat, leg press, regular free squat, and turn it into a movement where you're like, holy shit, I'm getting a lot deeper. This is hard, but also this feels smooth as fuck, and I feel fucking strong. The best possible combination you could ever say. I will say how people train their quads at a high level without weightlifting shoes is beyond me entirely, 
But then you look at how a lot of IFB pros quote unquote train their quads and you could like really improve the shit out of the training if you showed them how to use weightlifting shoes and proper technique. Now, those three things, I think if you're an advanced lifter, you should highly consider. Does that mean you should stay away from these tools as a beginner or as an intermediate? No. But what I would say is you can get a lot without them. They do cost money. They do wear down. You'll have to replace them. And the best reasoning I have for you is give me a compelling reason why you need these tools. And I will say it's a good idea to get them. For example, if you're a beginner and you never have grip as a limiting problem, why in fucking God's name do you need Versa Grips? Fact checked, problem solved. Weightlifting belt. If your legs are on fire, they're getting sore for five days in a row, your core is still getting stronger, you never have an issue where you're like, man, if I had a belt, I could share shit more, lift more with my legs and my weak core is keeping me away from being able to have stronger legs. That's just not a thing. Up until most people get, most women get beyond two plates on a squat for full depth and most men get beyond three plates on a squat, a lot of times for most people, a belt isn't even uh, just, that's like doing a whole lot of nothing, just sitting there. And weightlifting shoes is one of these things where you could get pretty early, but they're pretty expensive and have a requirement, big investment. So if you've been lifting for like six months or a year or a year and a half and you really love the process and you know you're not going to quit anytime soon, yeah, you can get weightlifting shoes. It's totally fine. Um, and also it pays to just have a situation where you don't really overinvest in the shit. It's like a lot of people buy $200 weightlifting shoes and then they just don't lift anymore. That's just sad. And weightlifting shoes really pay their big dividends once you're bigger and mobility is a little bit harder and you're lifting really, really high loads. So the super technique stuff is important. And also when you're constrained to variations that don't include squatting, like leg presses and hack squats, so squats are too axially loading for you, then weightlifting shoes pay huge dividends. But if you can do a decent barbell squat without weightlifting shoes, you can for years get bigger and bigger and bigger in your legs and not have to buy weightlifting shoes because they're benefit will be instant, but it'll be really small and maybe not worth the $200 that they cost. Now you can get weightlifting shoes for 70 bucks. That's all good and well, but just uh, making sure I'm speaking to the general audience member here. Like, uh, yeah, again, if there's a compelling reason, definitely buy it. When you're in your intermediate years, you may start to develop these compelling reasons and slowly buy up the stuff so that by the time you are an advanced lifter, you already have them. I'm not saying when you turn advanced to whatever, you have your fifth advanced birthday party and balloons and stuff and a clown that people beat with a piñata, uh, baseball bat. That's what you do to clowns, I think. Once you get through the piñata, you turn your attention to the clown, but you don't have the uh, no more eye cover. You put it on the clown, tie him up. No, I'm just kidding. But maybe. Clowns are terrible. Don't just turn advanced and then buy these things. As an intermediate, you'll discover like, okay, I really fucking need Versa grips. My grip is just a huge limiting factor. I need a belt. I would like some weightlifting shoes. So that by the time you enter advanced, you're already rolling with all these things. Folks, give that some thought. Like, comment, subscribe, whatever. And see you guys in the comments below.